Hi. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that today's episode deals with some pretty harsh and heavy themes from Guatemala's internal conflict and military dictatorships, including killings and forced disappearances. If you're sensitive to these things or you're in the room with small children, you might want to consider another time to listen. Okay, here's the show. It's early, about 7.30. I'm in the town of Antigua, <clears throat> Guatemala. Big volcano looms, looms over in the distance. And I'm in the, um, the bus terminal. It's all these former U.S. school buses painted just varying colors and totally done up. And so you couldn't even tell that they're former U.S. school buses, but they are. Many of them are still yellow. Uh, and I'm sitting in a, <clears throat> in a bus that I very well could have gone to elementary and high school in a long time ago. Same seats, right? Same, like, round bumps over the wheels in the back. The only difference is that now there's handrails that run up the middle and uh, luggage racks on the top. And I'm headed from Antigua to Chimaltenango and then up to Comalapa. So it's going to be a little bit of a ride. I'm in Guatemala's central highlands, a few hours from Tiquisate, where I visited in the last episode. The bus winds over mountain hills, heading north. One hour turns to two and then three. I think about the place where I'm headed. I'm nervous about what I'm going to find when I get there. Through the map app on my phone, I watch us getting nearer and nearer to the location. And then I get up and walk down the aisle. I step off onto the side of the highway, pine forest all around. There's a big white concrete wall built into the side of the hill. In front of it is a small green sign which reads Paisajes de la Memoria, Verdad y Justicia. Landscapes of Memory, Truth and Justice. I'm here. So I finally made it to this memorial for the disappeared here in Guatemala. And it has got to be one of the most intense and powerful and amazing and tumultuous things I've ever witnessed. This is Under the Shadow, a new investigative narrative podcast series that walks back in time to tell the story of the past by visiting momentous places in the present. This podcast is a co-production in partnership with The Real News and NACLA. I'm your host, Michael Fox, longtime radio reporter, editor, journalist, the producer and host of the podcast Brazil on Fire. I've spent the better part of the last 20 years in Latin America. I've seen firsthand the role of the U.S. government abroad, and most often, sadly, it is not for the better invasions, coups, sanctions, support for authoritarian regimes. Politically and economically, the United States has cast a long shadow over Latin America for the past 200 years. In each episode in this series, I will take you to a location where something historic happened, a landmark in revolutionary struggle or foreign intervention. Today, it might look like a random street corner, a church, a mall, a monument, or a museum, but every place I'm going to take you to was once the site of history-making events that shook countries, impacted lives, and left deep marks on the world. I'll try to discover what lingers of that history today. We'll dive deep into the past, and I'll take you there with me on Under the Shadow. This is Season 1, Central America, Episode 3, Guatemala, The Disappeared. I'm standing in this beautiful mountain pine forest. It almost smells like Colorado, you know, which is where I used to live for many years and used to study, work up in the mountains. 
birds are kind of twittering between the trees. You can kind of hear the, the highway off in the distance. Beautiful blue sky, sun overhead, warm, but a nice cool breeze. It's so comforting. Brown pine needles covering the ground in this thick mat, this thick soft mat. And before me is an open excavated mass grave. One of 52 that was found in this place. And one of three that they kept open so that the memory of what these graves meant and what they were and the violations and the deaths and the torture that happened here would not be forgotten. See, the place where this memorial is located is a former military barracks of the Guatemalan army. It's a couple of miles outside of San Juan Comalapa, a Mayan cachiquel town where the military government carried out at least five massacres during the 1980s. Of course, this was all during the country's nearly four-decade-long internal armed conflict, when activists, students, and community organizers were rounded up here by the military or police. This barracks was where they were often taken, and most of them were never seen again. Today, Max Peren is the caretaker of the memorial. He's from Comalapa. He's been watching over this place for almost 20 years. He says back in the 1980s, everyone suspected what was happening, but there was nothing they could do. Not until after the war ended in 1996. That was when family members began to look for their loved ones in unmarked graves here. They enlisted help from the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Foundation, which was founded in 1997 for exactly that reason, to help family members find and identify their disappeared loved ones. Between 1962 and 1996, 200,000 Guatemalans were killed and 45,000 were forcibly disappeared. For the majority of families, the whereabouts of those lost loved ones are still unknown, even decades after security forces abducted them. Most of the victims of the conflict were indigenous. Most of the perpetrators were members of government forces. Here at the former military barracks, the forensic anthropologists and relatives of the disappeared discovered the remains of 220 people, including a baby and two children. The remains were uncovered in the excavation of more than 50 unmarked graves between 2003 and 2005. Years later, through records and DNA samples, forensic anthropologists were able to identify about a fifth of those people. Of course, this was only a tiny, tiny fraction of the total disappeared here in Guatemala throughout the armed conflict. But nevertheless, it was a huge achievement, particularly in a country where the horrors of the Civil War have long been shrouded in secrecy and the perpetrators of those horrors have long been shielded from justice. Max says that even from the time of the first exhumations in 2003, the families of the disappeared said they wanted to see their deceased loved ones returned and buried here. And not just those who were identified, but all of the victims who were found here. Max says they said we pushed this process and we want to see their bodies returned here before we die. Max explains that the National Coordinator of Guatemalan Widows, known in Spanish by the acronym Conavigua, bought part of the land of the former barracks in chunks over years. They dreamed of one day opening this memorial. That dream finally became a reality in 2018. In a ceremony to lay the dead to rest in a dignified way, the families of the disappeared marched down the street alongside a truck loaded with 172 small wooden coffins carrying the recovered bodies. They placed both the identified and unidentified remains in rows of above-ground concrete graves under the peaceful pine forest. Victoria, a relative of a disappeared person, was there for the ceremony. Van a descansar en paz porque van a llevar al lugar donde... They will rest in peace, she said, because they are being taken someplace where they will rest forever. There is no better place. Feliciana is a member of the Widows Association that helped to found the memorial. 
This is really important because it's families working together who have been really hit by the war in Guatemala, she said during the opening of the memorial. This was a place of torture and killings by the Guatemalan army, and it's been transformed into something beautiful. And it's here where these people will rest. Beside the tombs is a square room known as a Nima Hai in the Kachikel language. Candles are lit there daily. It serves as a constant memorial for the dead and the disappeared. It's also a sacred place where Mayan ceremonies are held. A brightly painted mural wraps around the entirety of the outside of the building, depicting the community's connection with the past and the violence that same community has faced at the hands of military forces. Alongside the simple concrete graves, on the edge of the hillside, there's a little path. Alongside it runs a long white marble wall, engraved with the names of more than 6,000 people who were disappeared just in this region of Guatemala alone. These names just go on and on, and the names that disappeared. Jose Francisco Larajus, Jose Gabriel Martin Tun, Jose Cab... Jose Guillermo, Val Valenzuela, Aguilar, Jose Humberto, Guardado, Flores, Jose Ivan Herrera, Mata, Julio Antonio Escobar, Jerez, Marco Tulio, Gomez, Lima, Milton, Cabinal, Santa Cruz. All those names are from the town of Guatemala. Then we've got Esquintla, El Progreso, Chiquimula. So many from Chimaltanango, Baja Verapaz. They called this the silent holocaust here. 200,000 people were killed during Guatemala's internal conflict. 85% of them indigenous. So many of them, military, just walked in, surrounded their villages, separated men and women, and proceeded to kill and torture every last one of them. 93% of the deaths were carried out by state forces, military forces. More people died here in Guatemala than in the conflict in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Argentina, Chile, combined. The Guatemalan genocide was in many ways committed in the name of fighting communism, and the U.S. government played a tremendous role in supporting this violence. That, in a minute. Hey everyone, Maximilian Alvarez here, editor-in-chief of The Real News Network. We're going to get you right back to the program in a sec, I promise. But really quick, I just wanted to remind y'all that The Real News is an independent, viewer and listener-supported, grassroots media network. We don't take corporate cash, we don't have ads, and we never ever put our reporting behind paywalls. But we cannot continue to do this work without your support. It takes a lot of time, energy, and money to produce powerful, unique, and journalistically rigorous shows like Under the Shadow. So if you want more vital storytelling and reporting like this, we need you to become a supporter of The Real News now. Just head over to therealnews.com forward slash donate and donate today. It really makes a difference. Also, if you're enjoying Under the Shadow, then you will definitely want to follow NACLA, the North American Congress on Latin America. NACLA's reporting and analysis goes beyond the headlines to help you understand what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean from a progressive perspective. Visit NACLA.org to learn more. That's N-A-C-L-A dot org. All right. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. 
Remember, as we talked about in the last episode, the 1954 CIA coup that overthrew the government of Jacobo Arbenz destroyed any semblance of human rights and democracy in Guatemala. And it set the country on the tracks for decades of repression, violence, and successive U.S.-backed military dictatorships. I want to introduce someone here who's going to be with us throughout this episode. Sure, I'm Jo Marie Burt. I'm a political scientist and I teach uh, at George Mason University, the Shar School of Policy and Government. I'm also a senior fellow at the Washington Office on Latin America, and I'm currently the president of the Latin American Studies Association, LASA. Jo Marie is also a former NACLA editor, and she has spent years focused on state violence and transitional justice in Guatemala. There's, these, there's a lot of books that have written about the origins of these re- re- revolutionary movements in Central America, and they're all pointing to this one inevitable fact that these brutal, repressive, oligarchic and military regimes, giving people no option for political participation, for living just decent, you know, basic decent lives, leads inevitably to revolution, right? In Guatemala, that came in 1960, when a group of military officers took up arms against the state. Graham Russell is the founder and director of Rights Action. We also spoke with him in the last episode. The straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the post-coup regime was when Guatemala became used by the U.S. to try and overthrow the revolutionary movement in Cuba, like the uh, Playa de Giron and all that. That invasion, the U.S. was using part of the territory of Guatemala over near the Caribbean to train the the counter-Cuban revolutionary forces for their invasion. And that sent some sectors of the Guatemalan military into the mountains to say, we we have to overthrow this POS um, government. And and so the the small armed revolutionary movement begins in the late 50s, early 60s. And the the touchstone was the the new regime allowing the U.S. to stage their, their efforts to overthrow the Cuban revolution from Guatemalan soil. The revolt was quashed, but the rebellion grew, as did the repression. Gabriela Porras would know. Today she works at the Comalapa Memorial for the Disappeared, and she's also a member of Guatemala's Forensic Anthropology Foundation. But back in the 1970s, both her parents had joined the guerrilla resistance. Her dad would actually go on to be one of the people who signed the peace accords. She had to flee the country when she was about 10 years old, after her cousin was kidnapped, and they tried to take her too. I met her at her home in the forested hills outside of Guatemala City. She wears glasses, shoulder-length curly hair. She has a contagious smile and a lifetime's worth of history, both lived and learned. If you compare Guatemala with other countries in the region, these repressive tactics often happen here first because it's an easy place to silence. That's because many of the killings, the massacres and the disappearances happened far from the cities. The carnage largely took place in and against indigenous villages and communities. People there spoke their indigenous languages. Many spoke Spanish as a second language, if at all. The state strategy of forced disappearances really began in 1963 with the capture of 28 leaders of the Guatemalan Labor Party. They were disappeared, and from then on, forced disappearances became a part of the repression. The massacres that would also come are the result of the implementation in Latin America of practices that had previously been used in Indochina or Algeria. And the military who led the most repressive governments, particularly Lucas Garcia, who came from the school in France, is the one who started with the scorched earth policies. Scorched earth, the military strategy of wiping out whole indigenous villages in order to cut off support for the insurgency. That was the late 1970s. Guatemalan state security forces were already killing an average of 20 to 30 people a day, according to human rights groups at the time. This was one of the reasons President Jimmy Carter cut military aid to Guatemala in 1977. The military government wouldn't commit to human rights. But then something extraordinary happened that shook the region, the Sandinista Revolution. The left-wing insurgency in nearby Nicaragua successfully forces out U.S.-backed dictator Anastasio Somoza. The rebel Sandinistas take power, and their victory scares authoritarian regimes across Central America and the United States. 
The year is 1979, and the Sandinista revolution triumphs. Support from the United States and Israel to the Guatemalan army is significantly increased because it's very clear that they are very scared of the expansive effect of the possibility of a victory for Nicaragua. And of course, what that meant for us. It's an example that showed us that we could get there too. Political scientist Joe Marie Burt says the Guatemalan army didn't want to take any chances of letting the revolution spread to Guatemala. So they launched really what was a preemptive counterinsurgency. Um, and they launched these you know, scorched earth tactics in the countryside, starting really in 78, but intensifying over the next several years to a frenzy in 1982 and 1983 when Efrain Rios Montt uh, is the dictator of the day. Lo cierto del caso es que estamos en una guerra. Efraín Rios Montt, born-again Christian, a general in the Guatemalan army who took power in a military coup in March 1982. He has slick back hair, thick mustache, smooth smile. He likes to dress in these stylish white suits and is happy to speak to the press about the advances his country is achieving under his leadership, even if they are not true. Three months into his rule, foreign journalists interviewed him about violence in the countryside. So there's no repression on the part of the army, one of them asked. No, debe de haber. no there shouldn't be, he says. Today, it does not exist. I guarantee that in the past three months, from March 26th until now, no repression. It was a lie. Again, Joe Marie Burt. Uh, in his first few months, something like 10,000 people are murdered in massacres, right? So the m massive deployment of military operations against especially indigenous populations in the Western highlands and other parts of Guatemala, that, that was sort of between 78 and 82, 83. Meanwhile, Rios Mant and the Guatemalan army received newfound support from one man in particular. My fellow citizens of this great nation, with a deep awareness of the responsibility conferred by your trust, I accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Ronald Reagan entered office as U.S. president in January 1981. He promised to double down on issues of U.S. security and tackle the so-called communist threat close to home. Central America was ground zero. Central America is a region of great importance to the United States, and it is so close. San Salvador is closer to Houston, Texas, than Houston is to Washington, D.C. Central America is America. It's at our doorstep, and it's become the stage for a bold attempt by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and Nicaragua to install communism by force throughout the hemisphere. When half of our shipping tonnage and imported oil passes through Caribbean shipping lanes, and nearly half of all our foreign trade passes through the Panama Canal and Caribbean waters, America's economy and well-being are at stake. Reagan's government would have a tremendous impact across the region. I'll dig into all of that at length throughout this podcast series. In Guatemala, though, he was dedicated to once again jump-starting military assistance and support for Rios Montt's government and military. Well, ladies and gentlemen, President Rios Mount and I have had just had a useful exchange of ideas on the problems of the region and on our bilateral relations. In December 1982, Reagan met Rios Mont during his first visit to Central America. After the meeting, Reagan told reporters that the Guatemalan dictator had received a bum rap from human rights organizations. I know that President Rios Mont is a man of great personal integrity and commitment. His country is confronting a brutal challenge from guerrillas armed and supported by others outside Guatemala. I have assured the president that the United States is committed to support his efforts to restore democracy and to address the root causes of this violent insurgency. I know he wants to improve the quality of life for all Guatemalans and to promote social justice. My administration will do all it can to support his progressive efforts. Recibimos con complacencia 
Rios Mont said he appreciated the U.S. commitment to working with his government to achieve, quote, prosperity and economic opportunities in the region. Two days later, an elite U.S.-trained Guatemalan military battalion entered the indigenous jungle village of Dos Erres in the northern Peten. They massacred virtually all of its residents. Only two boys survived. The entire community was wiped out. 200 people killed in the, in the, in the space of a morning, really. And Kate Doyle uncovered these you know, U.S. declassified documents that um, show that the U.S. I mean, the U.S. flew over um, Dos Erres the, you know, the, a day or two after reports of the massacre had come in. It was very clear that they understood exactly what had happened and knew that the Rios Mont controlled military was responsible. And yet our policy of support for the Rios Mont and other military regimes sort of continued unabated, really. The following year, the U.S. officially resumed aid and training assistance to Guatemala. But documentary filmmakers and freelance journalists who traveled to Guatemala in 1982 found that actually the U.S. had never stopped offering assistance and training to the Guatemalan military. Between 1978 and 1980 alone, the Guatemalan military received almost $8 million from the State Department's military assistance program. While filming her award-winning 1983 documentary, When the Mountains Tremble, Pamela Yates and her team interviewed a U.S. Green Beret training Guatemalan soldiers on counterinsurgency tactics. He wears a camouflaged outfit, the words U.S. Army, written over his chest. I help them in infantry subjects, he says in Spanish. They often ask me about Vietnam and my experiences there, and I explain to them everything that happened there, and they're very interested in my experiences. I spoke with Yates about the U.S. role in Guatemala in the 1980s and U.S. support for the country's repressive and violent tactics. I would say that the United States helped to create the conditions. They trained the military men. Rios Mon himself was trained at the School of the Americas. And of course, they did reopen arms sales and provided arms to Guatemala. But, you know, the Guatemalan military was the one who carried out the genocide. Rios Mont and his allies were the ones who decided on the military strategy and the military tactics. So I would say that both, both the United States is complicit in the Guatemalan military carrying this out. And many of the documents, the documents that were declassified and are part of the National Security Archive, excellent uh, dossier on Guatemala, uh, are, are communiques from the U.S. Embassy about what they knew and what they didn't know. So they knew what was going on then, but they weren't able to stop it or they didn't want to stop it. There's all different degrees of complicity that you can read in the archives themselves. Atrocities continued long after the military coup that overthrew the Rios Mont government. And the United States was well aware of what was happening. The violence would stretch on for another decade until finally... 1996. Peace accords are signed between the government and the rebel forces. A momentous occasion ending 36 years of conflict. The agreement mandates demilitarization, respect for indigenous rights, and the creation of a UN Truth Commission. Joe Marie Burt. The Commission for Historical Clarification is very important. It comes out with its report in 1999. It determines that 200,000 people were killed in the course of the 36-year war in Guatemala. They documented 626 massacres. The vast majority, the vast majority committed by the military. It documented that 400 indigenous villages had been and rural villages completely wiped off the face of the earth as a, re a result of these military scorched earth counterinsurgency policies. And if the army and its proxy forces, mostly the um, civil defense patrols, 
in which it forced young, mostly indigenous men to participate in these sort of like um, paramilitary units. Um, were responsible for 93% of the violations. The guerrilla was responsible for 3% and 4% they were not able to determine. So you can see that the overwhelming uh, source of violence, of massive violations of human rights was the army. Rights Actions, Graham Russell. The genocides of the 80s served a similar purpose as the coup in 1954 was just to keep in place the same old, same old elites who are our partners. And so the wars of the 80s, they're sort of over, but they're not over because it's just a constant state of inequality, injustice and violence to keep in place a fundamentally unjust, violent, unequal political economic model. A model that's remained until today. But things may be about to shift. Bernardo Arevalo, the son of Guatemala's first democratically elected president, considered the father of the country's democratic spring, will be inaugurated on January 14, 2024. He has faced an onslaught of attempts to block first his candidacy and now his government, but he's risen above it and there is excitement in the air. You just can't overstate the upbeat energy because... The fear, the the fatigue, the anxiety, and and the legacy of all the the, the ongoing grinding poverty, the legacy of the the violence of the past, the legacy of recent violence, depending on what region of the country you live in, it's heavier than heavy. And so it's not like a yippee, happy hope in the country. It's a holy shit, but it's a real hope. And... It's, it's just slowly percolating up and up and up. Something else has been percolating since the end of the war. Demands for justice. In 2013, former dictator Rios Montt was convicted of genocide. That's the sound of the crowd in the courtroom exploding after the verdict is issued. Tears flow. Many chant justice. The trial used as key evidence, Pamela Yates' documentary, When the Mountains Tremble. Our filming and film outtakes were used as forensic evidence in the genocide case against Efraim Riosmont. It was key forensic evidence, actually, because it helped prove the chain of command, which is a very difficult thing to prove in a genocide case. In fact, genocide, the crime itself, is really hard to prove because most genocidaires have never gone to the scene of the crime. So you have to prove that they ordered these killings and that the killings were carried out. And then those who carried them out reported back up the chain of command to the person who ordered it. And the material that we contributed from When the Mountains Tremble um, provided that. The significance of the genocide case itself, well, it was the first time that anyone was tried for the genocide of indigenous people anywhere in the Americas. And that's really significant because there have been a lot of genocides against indigenous people in the Americas, as we know. Freelance journalist Alan Nairn reported from Guatemala in the 1980s. He told Democracy Now!'s Amy Goodman that U.S. officials should also be held accountable. Uh, All of the crimes were crimes not just of General Rios Montt, but also of the U.S. government. He told Amy Goodman that the Guatemalan courts should issue indictments against U.S. officials for their role in the genocide. Uh, the, the top officials of the Reagan administration who made the policy, uh, the U.S. CIA personnel on the ground who worked within the HEDOS, the military intelligence unit that coordinated the assassinations and disappearances, uh, the U.S. military uh, attaches who worked uh, with the Guatemalan generals to develop the sweep and massacre strategy in the mountains. There would be hundreds of U.S. officials who were complicit in this and should be subpoenaed, uh, called before a grand jury uh, and subjected to indictment, and the U.S. should be ready to extradite them to Guatemala to face punishment if the Guatemalan uh, authorities are able to proceed uh, with this. But just 10 days after Rios Montt's conviction, amid widespread backlash from the military and powerful groups, 
Guatemala's constitutional court vacated the verdict on a technicality. The retrial languished in the courts as the defense repeatedly stalled the case. Rios Montt died in 2018. He never served time. Joe Marie Burt. I mean, how do you calculate the level of responsibility the U.S. had? I mean, the U.S., with a brief interregnum during the Carter administration, when he pulled aid from Guatemala, which was then very quickly supplemented by Israel, um, the U.S. has very steadfastly supported the Guatemalan military during the course of the Civil War, knew about the violence that was happening. In fact, the National Security Archive and its you know key researcher there is Kate Doyle, um, have called from the archives numerous documents um, showing the level at which the U.S. knew exactly what was going on, either turned a blind eye or, you know, thought it was a good thing because they, they were fighting the communist threat, quote unquote. Condena para un ex jefe del ejército de Guatemala por una matanza de indígenas durante la dictadura de Efraín Ríos Montt. Rios Montt is not the only one whom the people of Guatemala have tried to hold accountable for their crimes. Over the last decade, Jo Marie herself has observed over a dozen trials in which survivors and families of the victims have fought to hold the perpetrators of horrendous crimes accountable. And so there have been numerous criminal prosecutions that have brought some, anyway, senior military officials to justice, also you know, mid-ranking officials, um, soldiers, and, and, and members of the civil defense patrols have also faced criminal charges. Not nearly as many trials or convictions as I think are needed in Guatemala, but it's still important what has been achieved at the level of seeking justice in Guatemala. It sort of allowed a window into how the Guatemalan state operated through the direct testimonies of victims. For Joe Marie, these trials are another face of the efforts by family members to remember the past, to not let it fade, so that it may never be repeated like the memorial for the dead and disappeared in Comalapa. Well, I think it's really important to highlight that in Guatemala, unlike other countries that have experienced massive human rights violations by the state, there is no state memorial or museum to commemorate the past. There's one in Peru, there's one in Chile, there's the ESMA in Argentina. There's nothing like that in Guatemala because the the Guatemalan military, the Guatemalan state continues to deny any responsibility for the human rights violations. Overall, it continues to deny responsibility for the human rights violations. that there, there, you know, there have been some, you know, the Colom government did acknowledge some responsibility in some instances. Um, but overall, the government's and the official story is there, there was nothing, nothing to see here, right? Um, we fought a war, we ended communism, the communist threat, and that's all there is to it. We, 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 you, know, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. That's the kind of logic, right? So memorials like the one in Comalapa and around the country are grassroots initiatives by the communities of survivors and families of the victims themselves. And so they, to me, they just carry so much meaning because they're forged by the very hands of the people who suffered this terrible violence at the hands of the Guatemalan military. Back at the Comalapa Memorial, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. See, while many figures within the U.S. government aided and abetted the violence in Guatemala, others from the United States have done their best to right the wrong. I mentioned at the beginning that the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Foundation had overseen the exhumations and identification of the bodies from the unmarked graves. Well, this foundation got its start after groups of survivors reached out to U.S. forensic anthropologist Dr. Clyde Snow. He'd worked on exhumations in Argentina following the reign of the state terror during the country's U.S.-backed military dictatorship, and he'd helped to set up Argentina's forensic anthropology team. So Dr. Clyde Snow 
went to Guatemala. He helped find the bodies here in Comalapa. He trained people for the work ahead, and he fell in love with their struggle and their communities. Snow passed away in 2014. When the Comalapa Memorial opened four years later, his wife fulfilled his last wish and brought his ashes to be buried here, among the disappeared. Here lies the remains of Clyde Collins Snow. Born Fort Worth, Texas, January 7, 1928. Died Norman, Oklahoma, May 16, 2014. I think it's just amazing that this man, the father of forensic anthropology, felt so strongly that he wanted to be buried with the bodies of the disappeared here in this hillside memorial with so many others. There's this kind of plaque here set off from the the wall of over 6,000 disappeared names uh, before it is as a basin with his ashes and it looks over this beautiful hillside and this kind of forest, pine forest, with a little plantation below of crops and corn being being grown down in the valley. The fact that he wanted to be buried here of all other places, I think just says a ton. It is so powerful. In the next episode, we will also visit a memorial for the innocent victims. But this time, it's across the Guatemalan border in El Salvador. Again, we'll look at the outsized role of the U.S. government in the war there and its support for widespread atrocities, but also the people who fought back. That's next time on Under the Shadow. Just a couple of things to say before I go. First, I wanted to let you know that you can find pictures of the Comalapa Memorial, where I started this episode, on the websites of both NACLA and The Real News. Second, I'd like to thank Pamela Yates for allowing us to use sound from her documentary When the Mountains Tremble in this episode. It's been 40 years since it came out, and in honor of the anniversary, she's re-releasing it, together with a trio of other documentaries she's made about Guatemala definitely check it out. There's a link to her production company, Skylight, in today's show notes. Finally, if you like what you hear, please consider heading over to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash M-F-O-X, M-Fox. There, you can support my work, become a monthly sustainer, or sign up to stay abreast of the latest on this podcast and my other reporting across Latin America. I appreciate the support. See you next time on Under the Shadow. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.